going shopping in the village, George's mother said to George on Saturday morning. So be a good boy and don't get up to mischief. Well, this is a silly thing to say to a small boy at any time. It immediately made him wonder what sort of mischief he might get up to. And don't forget to give Grandma her medicine at 11 o'clock, his mother said. Then out she went, closing the back door behind her. Grandma, who was dozing in her chair by the window, opened one wicked little eye and said, Now you heard your mother, George. Don't forget my medicine. No, Grandma, said George. And just try and behave yourself for once while she's away. Yes, Grandma, said George. Looking after that grisly old grunion of a grandma all by himself was hardly the most exciting way to spend a Saturday morning. His father was a farmer, and the farm they lived on was miles away from anywhere, so there was never any children to play with, and he was tired of staring out the window at, at pigs and cows and hens and sheep. You can make me a nice cup of tea for a start, Grandma said to George. That'll keep you out of mischief for a few minutes. <sighs> yes, Grandma, said George. He couldn't help disliking Grandma. She was a selfish, grumpy old woman. She had pale brown teeth and a small, puckered-up mouth. It was like a dog's bottom. How much sugar in your tea today, Grandma? George asked her. One spoon, she said, and no milk. And most grandmothers are lovely, kind, helpful old ladies, but not this one. She spent all day and every day sitting in her chair by the window, and she was always complaining and grousing, grouching, grumbling, griping about something or other. Never once, even on her best days, had she smiled at George and said, Well, how are you this morning, George? Or, hey, why don't you and me have a game of snakes and ladders? Or, how was school today, George? She didn't seem to care about other people. She was a miserable old grouch. George went into the kitchen and made Grandma a cup of tea with a tea bag. He put one spoon of sugar in it and no milk. He stirred the sugar well and carried the cup into the living room. Grandma sipped the tea. It's not sweet enough, she said. Put more sugar in. So George took the cup back to the kitchen and added another spoonful of sugar. He stirred it again and carried it carefully into Grandma. Where's the saucer? she said. I won't have a cup without a saucer. So George fetched her a saucer. And what about a, a teaspoon, if you please? I stirred it for you, Grandma. I stirred it well. I'll stir my own tea, thank you very much, she said. Fetch me a teaspoon. So George fetched her a teaspoon. When George's mother or father were at home, Grandma never ordered George about like this. It was only when she had him on her own that she began treating him badly. You know what's the matter with you, the old woman said staring at George over the rim of her teacup with those bright, wicked little eyes. You're growing too fast. Boys who grow too fast become stupid and lazy. I can't help it if I'm growing fast, Grandma, George said. Of course you can, she snapped. Growing's a nasty, childish habit. But we have to grow, Grandma. If we didn't grow, we'd never be grown-ups. Grandma snorted. <laughs> Rubbish, boy. Rub-ish. Look at me. Hmm? Am I growing? Certainly not. Ah, but you did once, Grandma. Only very little, the old woman answered. I gave up growing when I was extremely small, along with all the other nasty childish habits, like laziness and disobedience and greed and sloppiness and untidiness and stupidity. You haven't given up any of those things, have you? Well, I'm still only a little boy, Grandma. You're eight years old, she snorted. <laughs> That's old enough to know better. If you don't stop growing soon, it'll be too late. Too late for what, Grandma? Well, shut up, George. It's ridiculous. You're nearly as tall as me already. George took a good look at Grandma. She certainly was a very tiny person. Her legs were so short, she had to have a footstool to put her feet on. And her head only came halfway up the back of the armchair. Daddy says it's fine for a man to be tall, George said. Don't listen to your daddy, said Grandma. You listen to me. But how do I stop myself growing, George asked her. You eat less chocolate, Grandma said. Well, does, does chocolate make you grow? It makes you grow the wrong way, she snapped. Up, 
instead of down. Grandma sips some tea. Yeah. But she never took her eyes from the little boy who stood before her. Never grow up, she said. Always grow down. And stop eating chocolate. Eat cabbage instead. Oh, cabbage? Oh, no. I don't like cabbage, said George. And it's not what you like or what you don't like, Grandma snapped. It's what's good for you that counts. From now on, you must eat cabbage three times a day. Mountains of cabbage. And if it's got caterpillars in it, so much the better. Ah, said George. Oh, our mummy washes caterpillars down the sink. Yeah, well, mummy's as stupid as you are, said Grandma. Cabbage doesn't taste of anything without a few boiled caterpillars in it. Slugs, too. Not slugs, George cried out. I couldn't eat slugs. Grandma squeezed her lips together tight so her mouth became a tiny wrinkled hole. Ooh, whenever I see a live slug on a piece of lettuce, I gobble it up quick before it crawls away. Delish us. <laughs> Worms and slugs and beetly bugs. You don't know what's good for you. <laughs> You're joking, Grandma. I never joke, she said. Beetles are perhaps the best of all. Oh, they go crunch. Just imagine it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you know, you get a beetle inside the stem of a stick of celery. Sometimes it's earwigs. A big, fat earwig is very tasty. But you've got to be very quick, my dear, when you put one of those in your mouth. It's got a sharp pair of nippers on its back end. And if it grabs your tongue with those, it never lets go. So you've got to bite the earwig first. Chop, chop, before it bites you. George started edging towards the door. He wanted to get as far away as possible from this filthy old woman. You're trying to get away from me, aren't you? She said, pointing a finger straight at George's face. You're trying to get away from Grandma. Could it be, George wondered, that she was a witch? He'd always thought witches were only in fairy tales, but now he wasn't so sure. Come closer to me, little boy, she said, beckoning to him with a horny finger. Come closer to me, and I will tell you secrets. Well, George didn't move. Grandma didn't move either. I know a great many secrets, she said. Her smile was thin and icy. The kind of smile a snake might make just before it bites you. George took a step backwards, edging closer to the door. You mustn't be frightened of your old grandma, she said, and leaned forward in her chair, whispering in a throaty sort of voice George had never heard her use before. Some of us have magic powers that can twist the creatures of this earth into wondrous shapes. A tingle of electricity flashed down the length of George's spine. He began to feel really frightened. Grandma went on. Some of us have fire in our tongues and sparks in our bellies and wizardry in the tips of our fingers. Some of us know secrets that would make your hair stand straight up on end and your eyes pop out of their sockets. George began to tremble. He wanted to run away, but his feet were stuck to the floor. We know how to make your nails drop off and teeth grow out of your fingers instead. We know how to make you wake up in the morning with a long tail coming out from behind you. We know secrets, my dear, about dark places where dark things live and squish and slither all over each other. Grandma, cried out George, stop! And he made a dive for the door. Doesn't matter how far you run, he heard her saying. You won't ever get away. George ran into the kitchen, slamming the door behind him. He was shaking a little. He really hated that horrid old witchy woman. But all of a sudden he had a tremendous urge to do something about her. Something whopping. Something absolutely terrific. A real shocker. A sort of explosion. He wanted to blow away the witchy smell that hung around her in the next room. He may have only been eight years old, but he was a brave little boy. He was ready to take this woman on. I'm not going to be frightened by her, he said softly to himself. But he was frightened. And that's why he wanted suddenly to explode her away. Well, not quite away, but he did want to shake her up a bit. So what should it be, this whopping, terrific, exploding shocker for Grandma? George sat and thought for a while. 
He'd have liked to have put a banger under her chair. But he didn't have one. He would have liked to have put a long green snake down the back of her dress. But he didn't have a long green snake. He would have liked to put six big black rats in the room with her and lock the door. But he didn't have six big black rats. And as George sat there, pondering this interesting problem, his eye fell upon the bottle of Grandma's brown medicine standing on the sideboard. Rotten stuff, it seemed to be. Four times a day, a large spoonful of it was shoveled into her mouth, and it didn't do her the slightest bit of good. She was always just as horrid after she'd had it as she'd been before. And the whole point of medicine, surely, was to make a person better. If it didn't do that, it was quite useless. Aha! thought George, suddenly. I know exactly what I shall do. I shall make her a new medicine. One that's so strong and so fierce and so fantastic that it'll either cure her completely or blow off the top of her head. I'll make her a magic medicine. A medicine no doctor in the world has ever made before. George looked at the kitchen clock. It said five past ten. There was nearly an hour left before Grandma's next dose was due at eleven. Here we go then, cried George, jumping up from the table. A magic medicine it shall be. So give me a bug and a jumping flea. Give me two snails and lizards three. And a slimy squiggler from the sea. And the poisonous sting of a bumblebee. And the juice from the fruit of the boo-boo tree. And the powdered bone of a wombat's knee. And one hundred other things as well, each with a rather nasty smell. I'll stir them up. I'll boil them long. A mixture tough. A mixture strong. And then, hey-ho, and down it goes. A nice big spoonful. Hold your nose. Just gulp it down and have no fear. And how do you like it, granny dear? Will she go pop? Will she explode? Will she go flying down the road? Will she go poof in a puff of smoke? Or will she start fizzing like a can of coke? Who knows? Not I. Let's wait and see. I'm glad it's neither you nor me. Oh, Grandma, if you only knew what I have got in store for you. <laughs> George's grandma was a selfish, grumpy old woman. She had pale brown teeth and a small, puckered-up mouth, like a dog's bottom. What's more, George had a pretty good idea that she was a witch. She was really horrible. He sat in the kitchen, too frightened to go back into the room where grandma was. There on the sideboard stood the bottle of medicine. It never did grandma any good, but she had to have it four times a day, and the next dose was due at eleven o'clock. Suddenly, George knew exactly what to do about that horrid old witchy woman. He would make her a new medicine, one that was so strong it would either cure her completely or blow off the top of her head. He took an enormous saucepan from the sideboard and placed it on the kitchen table. George! came Grandma's shrill voice from the next room. What are you doing? Um, nothing, Grandma. You needn't think I can't hear you just because you closed the door. You're rattling the saucepans. No, I'm, I'm just, uh, just tidying the kitchen, Grandma. And then there was silence. George had absolutely no doubts whatsoever about how he was going to make his famous medicine. He wasn't going to fool about wondering whether to put in a little bit of this or a little bit of that. Quite simply, he was going to put in everything he could find. Nobody had ever made a medicine like that before. And if it didn't actually cure Grandma, at least it would cause some exciting results. George decided to work his way around the various rooms, one at a time, and see what they had to offer. Upstairs in the bathroom, George gazed at the famous and dreaded medicine cupboard, but he didn't go near it. It was the only thing in the entire house he was forbidden to touch. There were things in there that could kill people. He made a solemn promise to his parents about this, and he wasn't going to break it. Anyway, there are plenty of other good things in the bathroom. Here's one. Golden Gloss Hair Shampoo. That ought to wash her tummy nice and clean, said George, as he emptied it into the pan. He took a full tube of toothpaste, squeezed out the whole lot in great long white worms. Maybe that'll brighten up those horrid brown teeth of hers, he said. There was an aerosol can of Super Foam Shaving Soap belonging to his father. George loved playing with aerosols. He pressed the button and kept his finger on it till there was nothing left. And the wonderful mountain of white foam built up in the giant saucepan. With his fingers, he scooped out the contents of a jar of vitamin-enriched face cream. In went a small bottle of nail varnish. 
If the toothpaste doesn't clean her teeth, George said, then this will paint them as red as roses. <laughs> he found another jar of creamy stuff. Hair remover. Smear it on your legs and allow it to remain for five minutes. George dipped it all into the saucepan. Then there was some yellow stuff called Dishworth's famous dandruff cure. And a white powder for cleaning false teeth. And the last thing was another aerosol can. <sighs> Nevermore punking deodorant spray, guaranteed to keep away unpleasant body smells for a whole day. She could use plenty of that, said George, and sprayed it all into the saucepan. Then he went to look in the bedroom. There, on his mother's dressing table, was yet another lovely aerosol can. Helga's hair set. Hold 12 inches away from the hair and spray lightly. Spray lightly. He squirted the whole lot into the saucepan. He did enjoy squirting those aerosols. There's a bottle of perfume there called Flowers of Turnips. Which smells of old cheese. <clears throat> in it went. Then there was a round box of powder. It was called Pink Plaster. There was a powder puff on top and he threw that in as well for good luck. He found a couple of lipsticks. He squeezed them out and chucked them in. Ugh. Then he went downstairs. In the laundry room, the shelves were full of all kinds of household items. The first one was a large box of super wipe for automatic machines. Dirt will disappear like magic. George didn't know whether Grandma was automatic or not, but she certainly was a dirty old woman, so she'd better have it all. There was a round cardboard carton on the shelf. It said, flea powder for dogs. Keep well away from the dog's food, because this powder, if eaten, will make the dog explode. Good, said George, and he poured it all into the saucepan. The next box was canary seed. <laughs> Perhaps this will make the old bird sing, said George. Well now, thought George. Grandma's medicine is brown, so my medicine must be brown too, or she'll smell a rat. A good way to colour it will be with this tin of brown shoe polish. He scooped it out with an old spoon and plopped it into the mixture. And he was just about to go into the kitchen when he saw a bottle of gin near the door. Grandma was very fond of gin. She was allowed to have a small nip of it every evening. Now he would give her a treat. He would pour in the whole bottle. And he did. Back in the kitchen, George put the huge saucepan on the table. Then he had a look at the bottles and jars on the shelves. He chose a tin of curry powder, a tin of mustard powder, a bottle of extra hot chilli sauce, a jar of black peppercorns, and a bottle of horseradish sauce. George, came the screechy voice from the next door room. What are you up to in there? Uh, nothing, Grandma. Absolutely nothing. Is it time for my medicine yet? Uh, no, Grandma, not for about half an hour. Well, just so you don't forget it. I won't, Grandma. I promise, I won't. At this point, George suddenly had an extra good wheeze. Although the medicine cupboard in the house was forbidden to him, what about the animal medicines his father kept in the shed? Nobody had ever told him he mustn't touch those. <coughs> Let's face it, George said to himself, hairspray and shaving cream and shoe polish are all very well, and they'll no doubt cause some splendid explosions inside the old geezer. But what the magic mixture needs now is a touch of the real stuff, real pills and tonics to give it punch and muscle. dusty old shed. Up on the medicine shelf, there were five big bottles. Two had pills in, two had runny stuff in, and the last one had orange powder. The label on the powdery one said, for chickens with foul pest, hen gripe, sore beaks, gammy leg, cochralitis, egg trouble, broodiness, or loss of feathers. Mix one spoonful only with each bucket of food. Well, said George, the old bird won't be losing any feathers after she's had a dose of this. The next bottle had gigantic purple pills in. For horses with horse throats, the label said. The horse-throated horse should suck one pill twice a day. Well, Grandma may not have a horse throat, George said, but she's certainly got a sharp tongue. Maybe they'll cure that instead. 
and into the pan went the gigantic purple pills. Then there was a bottle of thick yellowish liquid. For cows, bulls and bullocks, we'll cure cowpox, crumpled horns, bad breath in bulls, earache, toothache, headache, hoofache, tailache and sore udders. That grumpy old cow in the living room has every one of those rotten illnesses, George said. She'll need it all. And with a slop and a gurgle, the yellow liquid splashed into the saucepan. The label on the next bottle said sheep dip, for getting rid of sheep rot, ticks and fleas. Mix one spoonful in one gallon of water and slosh it over the sheep. Caution! Do not make the mixture any stronger or the wool will fall out and the animal will be naked. By gum, said George, how I'd love to walk in and slosh it all over Grandma and watch the ticks and fleas go jumping off her. But I can't, I mustn't, so she'll have to drink it instead. The last bottle on the shelf had pale green pills in. Pig pills. For pigs with pork prickles, tender trotters, bristle blight and swine sickness. Give one pill twice a day. More than that will make the pig rock and roll. Just the stuff for that miserable old pig back there in the house, said George. She'll need a very big dose. Finally, just for luck, he put in half a pint of engine oil to keep Grandma's engine running smoothly. And a handful of grease to grease her creaking joints. <laughs> Then he staggered back to the house with the enormous heavy saucepan to give it a good quick boil on the stove. <laughs> Soon the marvellous mixture was frothing and bubbling. The rich blue smoke filled the kitchen with a fiery, fearsome smell. It was brutal and bewitching, spicy and staggering, fierce and frenzied, full of wizardry and magic. Whenever George got a whiff of it up his nose, Firecrackers went off in his skull, and electric prickles ran along the backs of his legs. Suddenly, he found himself chanting strange words that came into his head out of nowhere. Fiery broth and witch's brew, foamy froth and rich's blue, fume and spume and spoon drift spray, frizzle, swizzle, shout hooray! Watch it sloshing, swashing, sploshing, hear it hissing, squishing, spissing, grandma better start to pray. There was only one problem. Grandma's ordinary medicine was brown, and the new medicine was a deep and brilliant blue colour. It needs more brown in it, said George. It simply must be brown, or she'll get suspicious. He dashed outside and came back with a can of dark brown gloss paint. Where's that medicine of mine, boy? came the voice from the living room. You're forgetting me. You're doing it on purpose. I shall tell your mother. I'm, uh, I'm not forgetting you, Grandma, George called back. I'm thinking of you all the time. The paint had cooled the mixture down and made it go a lovely, rich, creamy brown. He tipped all Grandma's real medicine down the sink. And now all he had to do was pour the new magic mixture into the bottle using this small jug. There. He put the cork back in the bottle. Medicine time, Grandma! And holding a spoon in one hand and the bottle in the other, he advanced into the living room. <laughs> It was 11 o'clock. Time for George to give his horrible, wicked old grandma her dose of medicine. But he wasn't going to give her the ordinary stuff that she normally had. Oh no, he was going to give her the real thing. The marvellous, magical mixture that he, George, had brewed up in his mother's great big saucepan. In the living room, grandma sat hunched in her chair by the window. The wicked little eyes followed George as he crossed the room towards her. You're late, she snapped. I don't think I am, Grandma. Don't interrupt me in the middle of a sentence, she shouted. But you'd finished your sentence, Grandma. There you go again, she cried, always interrupting and arguing. You really are a tiresome little boy. Oh, what's the time? It's exactly 11 o'clock, Grandma. You're lying as usual. Stop talking so much and give me my medicine. Shake the bottle first, then pour it into the spoon, and make sure it's a whole spoonful. Um, are you going to gulp it all down in one go? George asked her. Or will you sip it? What I do is none of your business, the old woman said. Fill the spoon. 
As George removed the lid and began very slowly to pour the thick brown stuff into the spoon, he couldn't help thinking back upon all the mad and marvellous things that had gone into the making of this crazy stuff. The shaving soap, the hair remover, the dandruff cure, the automatic washing machine powder, the flea powder for dogs, the shoe polish, the black pepper, the horseradish sauce, and all the rest of them. Not to mention the powerful animal pills and powders and liquids, and the brown paint. Uh, open your mouth wide, Grandma, he said, and I'll pop it in. The old hag opened her small wrinkled mouth, showing disgusting pale brown teeth. Here we go, George cried out. Swallow it down. Woof! And he pushed the spoon well into her mouth and tipped the mixture down her throat. Then he stepped back to watch the result. It was worth watching. Grandma yelled, Ow! Ow! And the whole body shot whoosh up into the air. It was exactly as though someone had pushed an electric wire through the underneath of her chair and switched on the current. Up she went, like a jack-in-the-box. And she didn't come down. She stayed there, suspended in mid-air, about two feet up, still in a sitting position, but rigid now, frozen, quivering, the eyeballs bulging, the hair standing straight up on end. Um, is something wrong, Grandma? George asked her politely. Are you all right? Suspended up there in space, the old girl was beyond speaking. The shock that George's marvellous mixture had given her must have been tremendous. You'd have thought she'd swallowed a red-hot poker the way she took off from that chair. Then she came down again with a <laughs> plop, back into her seat. Ah! Call the fire brigade, she shouted suddenly. My stomach's on fire! It's just the medicine, Grandma, George said. It's good, strong stuff. Ah, fire! The old woman yelled. Fire in the basement! Get a bucket! Man the hoses! Ah, do something quick! Cool it, Grandma, George said. But he got a bit of a shock when he saw the smoke coming out of her mouth and out of her nostrils. Clouds of black smoke were coming out of her nose and blowing round the room. By golly, you really are on fire, George said. Of course I'm on fire, she yelled. I'll be burned to a crisp. I'll be fried to a frazzle. I'll be boiled like a beetroot. George ran into the kitchen and came back with a jug of water. Open your mouth, Grandma, he cried. He could hardly see her for the smoke, but he managed to pour half a jugful down her throat. And a sizzling sound, the kind you get if you hold a hot frying pan underneath a cold tap, came up from deep down inside Grandma's stomach. And the old hag bucked and shied and snorted. And spouts of water came shooting out of her nose. And the smoke cleared away. The fire's out, George announced proudly. You'll be all right now, Grandma. All right, she yelled. Who's all right? Oh, uh, there's squigglers in my belly. There's bangers in my bottom. She began bouncing up and down on the chair. Quite obviously, she was not very comfortable. You'll find it's doing you a lot of good, that medicine, Grandma, George said. Good, she screamed. Doing me good? It's killing me. And then a funny thing happened. Grandma's body gave a sudden sharp twist and a sudden sharp jerk, and she flipped herself out of the chair, landed neatly on her two feet on the carpet. That's terrific, Grandma, George cried. You haven't stood up like that for years. Look at you. You're standing up all on your own, and you're not even using a stick. Grandma didn't even hear him. The frozen, pop-eyed look was back with her again now. She was miles away in another world. Marvellous medicine, George told himself. He found it fascinating to stand there and watch what it was doing to the old hag. What next, he wondered, and he soon found out. Suddenly, she began to grow. It was quite slow at first, just a very gradual inching upwards. Up, 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 by an inch every few seconds. And in the beginning, George didn't notice it. But when she had passed the five foot six mark and was going on upwards towards being six foot tall, George gave a jump and shouted, Hey, Grandma! You're growing! You're growing up! Hang on, Grandma! You, you better stop now or you'll be hitting the ceiling! But Grandma didn't stop. It was a truly fantastic sight. This ancient, scrawny old woman getting taller and taller, longer and longer, thinner and thinner, as though she were a piece of elastic being pulled upwards by invisible hands. And when the top of her head actually touched the ceiling, George thought she was bound to stop. But she didn't. There was a sort of scrunching noise. 
And bits of plaster and cement came raining down. Oh, hadn't you better stop now, Grandma? George said. Daddy's just had this whole room repainted. But there was no stopping her now. Soon her head and her shoulders had completely disappeared through the ceiling. And she was still going. George dashed upstairs to his own bedroom, and there she was, coming up through the floor, like a mushroom. Whoa, Pee! she shouted, finding her voice at last. Hallelujah! Here I come! Steady on, Grandma, George said. With a hey nonny no, and up we go, she shouted. Just watch me grow! This is my room, George said. Look at the mess you're making. Terrific medicine, she cried. Give me some more. She's as dotty as a donut, George thought. Come on, boy, give me some more, she yelled. Dish it out, I'm slowing down. George was still clutching the medicine bottle in one hand and the spoon in the other. Uh, well, he thought, why not? And he poured out a second dose and he plopped it into her mouth. Pow wee! she screamed, and up she went again. Her feet were still on the floor downstairs in the living room, but her head was moving quickly towards the ceiling of the bedroom. I'm on my way now, boy, she called down to George. Just watch me go! That's the attic above you, Grandma, George called out. I'll keep out of there. Um, it's, it's full of bugs and bogles. Crash! The old girl's head went through the ceiling as though it were butter. George stood in his bedroom, gazing at the shambles. There was a big hole in the floor and another in the ceiling, and sticking up like a post between the two was the middle part of Grandma. Her legs were in the room below, her head in the attic. I'm still going, came the old screechy voice from up above. Give me another dose, my boy, and let's go through the roof. No, Grandma, no, George called back. You're busting up the whole house. To heck with the house, she shouted. I want some fresh air. I haven't been outside for 20 years. By golly, she is going through the roof, George told himself. He ran downstairs, he rushed out of the back door into the yard. It'd be simply awful, he thought, if she bashed up the roof as well. His father would be furious, and he, George, would get the blame. He'd made the medicine. He'd given her too much. Don't come through the roof, Grandma, prayed George. Please, don't. George stood in the farmyard, looking up at the roof. There was no sign of Grandma. Whew. The old Wurzels got stuck in the attic, George thought. Thank goodness for that. But then, very slowly, like some weird monster rising up from the deep, Grandma's head came through the roof. Then her scrawny neck and the tops of her shoulders how am I doing, boy? she shouted. How's about that for a bash up? Don't you think you'd better stop now, Grandma? George called out. I have stopped, she answered. I feel terrific. Didn't I tell you I had magic powers? Didn't I warn you I had wizardry in the tips of my fingers? But yeah, you wouldn't listen to your old Grandma. You didn't do it, Grandma, George shouted back to her. I did it. I made you a new medicine. A new medicine? You? What rubbish! She yelled. I did? I did! George shouted. You're lying as usual, Grandma yelled. You're always lying! I'm not lying, Grandma. I swear I'm not. The wrinkled old face high up on the roof stared down suspiciously at George. Are you telling me you actually made a new medicine all by yourself? She shouted. Yes, Grandma, all by myself. Well, I don't believe you, she answered. But I'm very comfortable up here. Fetch me a cup of tea. Now, a brown hen was pecking about in the yard, close to where George was standing, and the hen gave him an idea. Quickly, he uncorked the medicine bottle and poured some of the brown stuff into the spoon. Watch this, Grandma, he shouted. He crouched down, holding out the spoon to the hen. Chicken, he said. Chick, chick, chicken. Come here, have some of this. A chicken's are stupid birds and very greedy. They think everything is food. This one thought the spoon was full of corn. It hopped over and looked at the spoon. Come on, chicken, George said. Good chicken. Chick, 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 chick. And the brown hen stretched out its neck towards the spoon and went peck. It got a beak full of medicine. The effect was electric. Ah, 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 shrieked the hen and shot straight up in the air like a rocket. It went as high as the house. Then down it came again into the yard, splosh. And there it sat, with its feathers all sticking out straight from its body. There was a look of amazement on its stupid face. You've done it in, you stupid boy, Grandma shouted. That hen's gonna die. Your father will be after you now. He'll give you a hiding and serve you right. But now the hen began to grow. 
George had been waiting for this to happen. It's growing, he yelled. Grandma, look, it's growing. Bigger and bigger, taller and taller it grew. Soon the hen was four or five times its normal size. Can you see it, Grandma? George shouted. I can see it, boy, the old girl shouted back. I'm watching it. George was hopping about from one foot to the other with excitement. It's had the magic medicine, Grandma, and it's growing, just like you did. But there was a difference between the way the hen was growing and the way Grandma grew. When Grandma grew taller and taller, she got thinner and thinner. The hen didn't. It stayed nice and plump all along. Soon it was taller than George. But it didn't stop there. It went right on growing until it was about as big as a horse. And then it stopped. Doesn't it look marvellous, Grandma? George shouted. Well, it's not as tall as me, Grandma sang out. Compared with me, that hen is titchy small. I am the tallest of them all! George's medicine was having some pretty exciting results. His revolting old grandma had gone right through the roof for a start. And down in the farmyard, George had given a beak full of the stuff to an unsuspecting brown hen. That hen was now growing into an unusually large bird. In fact, by the time it was finished, it was about as big as a horse. At that moment, George's mother came back from shopping in the village. She drove her car into the yard and she got out. She was carrying a bottle of milk in one hand and a bag of groceries in the other. The first thing she saw was the gigantic brown hen towering over little George. Well, she dropped the bottle of milk. <coughs> then Grandma started shouting at her from the rooftop. And when she looked up and saw Grandma's head sticking up through the tiles, she dropped the bag of groceries as well. How about that then, eh, Mary? Grandma shouted. I'll bet you've never seen a hen as big as that. That's George's giant hen, that is. But, 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 stammered George's mother. It's George's magic medicine, Grandma shouted. We both of us had it, the hen and I. But how in the world did you get up on the roof, cried the mother. Ah, ha, ha, I didn't, cackled the old woman. My feet are still standing on the floor in the living room. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Well, this was too much for George's mother to understand. She just goggled and gaped. She looked as though she was going to faint. A second later, George's father appeared. His name was Mr. Killy Cranky. He was a kind father to George, but he was not an easy person to live with, because even the smallest things got him all worked up and excited. And the hen standing in the yard was certainly not a small thing. And when Mr. Cranky saw it, he started jumping about as though something was burning his feet. Great heavens, he cried, waving his arms. What's this? What's happened? Where did it come from? It is a giant hen. Who did it? I did, George said. Look at me, Grandma shouted from the rooftop. Never mind about the hen. What about me? Mr. Cranky looked up and saw Grandma. Shut up, Grandma, he said. Didn't seem to surprise him that the old girl was sticking up through the roof. It was the hen that excited him. He'd never seen anything like it. But then who had? It's fantastic, Mr. Cranky shouted, dancing round and round. It's colossal. It's gigantic. It's tremendous. It's a miracle. How did you do it, George? And George started telling his father about the magic medicine. While he was doing this, the big brown hen sat down in the middle of the yard and went cluck, 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 and everyone stared at it. And when it stood up again, there was a brown egg lying there. The egg was the size of a football. That egg would make scrambled eggs for 20 people, Mrs. Cranky said. George, Mr. Cranky shouted, how much of this medicine have you got? Uh, lots, George said. There's a big saucepan full in the kitchen, and this bottle here is nearly full. Mr. Cranky grabbed George by the arm. Come with me, he yelled. Bring the medicine. Oh, for years and years I've been trying to breed bigger and bigger animals. Bigger bulls for, for beef, bigger pigs for pork, bigger sheep for mutton. And they went to the pigsty first. George gave a spoonful of medicine to the pig, and in a few moments, this is what it looked like. And the same thing happened when Mr. Cranky's herd of fine black bullocks each had a dose of George's medicine. After that, it was the sheep, 
Then George gave some to his grey pony, Jack Frost. And finally, just for fun, he gave some to Alma, the nanny goat. Grandma, from high up on the rooftop, could see everything that was going on, and she didn't like what she saw. She wanted to be the centre of attention, and nobody was taking the slightest notice of her. George and Mr Cranky were running round and getting excited about the enormous animals, Mrs Cranky was washing up in the kitchen, and Grandma was all alone on the rooftop. Hey, you! she yelled. George, get me a cup of tea this minute, you idle little beast! Don't listen to the old goat, Mr Cranky said. She's stuck where she is, and a good thing too. Well, we can't leave her up there, Dad, George said. What if it rains? George! Grandma yelled. Ugh, you horrible little boy! You disgusting little worm! Fetch me a cup of tea at once, and a slice of currant cake! We'll have to get her out, Dad, George said. She won't give us any peace if we don't. Mrs Cranky came outside and agreed with George. She's my mother, she said. She's a pain in the neck, Mr Cranky said. I don't care, Mrs Cranky said. I'm not leaving my own mother sticking up through the roof for the rest of her life. So in the end, Mr Cranky telephoned the crane company and asked them to send one of their biggest cranes out to the house at once. The crane arrived one hour later. It was on wheels and there were two men inside it. They put ropes under Grandma's arms, and then she was lifted right up through the roof. In a way, the medicine had done Grandma good. It hadn't made her any less grumpy or bad-tempered, but it seemed to have cured all her aches and pains. And she was suddenly as frisky as a ferret. As soon as the crane had lowered her to the ground, she ran over to George's huge pony, Jack Frost, and jumped on his back. Then the ancient old hag galloped about the farm on the gigantic pony, jumping over trees and sheds and shouting, Get out of my way! Clear the decks! Stand aside, all you miserable midgets, or I'll trample you all to death! Yeah, and other silly things like that. But because Grandma was now much too tall to get back into the house, she had to sleep that night in the hay barn with the mice and the rats. <laughs> and the next day, George's father came down to breakfast in a state of even greater excitement than ever. I have been awake all night thinking about it, he cried. About what, Dad? George asked him. About your marvellous medicine, of course. We can't stop now, my boy. We must start making more of it at once. But why do we need more, Dad? George asked. We've done all our own animals, and we've made Grandma feel as frisky as a ferret, even though she does have to sleep in the barn. My dear boy, cried Mr Killy Cranky, we need barrels and barrels of it. Tons and tons. Then we will sell it to every farmer in the world so that all of them can have giant animals. We will build a marvellous medicine factory and sell the stuff in bottles at five pounds a time. We will become rich. You will become famous. But w wait a minute, Dad, said George. There's no waiting, cried Mr Cranky, working himself up so much that he put butter in his coffee and milk on his toast. Don't you understand what this tremendous invention of yours is going to do to the world? Nobody will ever go hungry again. Why won't they? asked George. Because one giant cow will give 50 buckets of milk a day. One giant chicken will make a hundred fried chicken dinners. And one giant pig will give you a thousand pork chops. It's tremendous. My dear boy, it's fantastic. It'll change the world. But wait a minute, Dad, George said again. Don't keep saying wait a minute, shouted Mr Cranky. There isn't a minute to wait. We must get cracking at once. Do calm down, my dear, Mrs Cranky said from the other end of the table, and stop putting marmalade on your cornflakes. Mr Cranky leapt up from his chair. Never mind about the cornflakes, he cried. Come on, George, let's get going. When the new mixture is ready, we'll test it out on an old hen, just to make absolutely sure we've got it right. And after that, we'll shout hooray and build a giant factory! <laughs> but I can't possibly remember all the hundreds of things I put into the saucepan to make the medicine, said George. Of course you can, my dear boy, cried Mr Cranky. I'll help you. I'll jog your memory. You'll get it in the end. You see if you don't. Now then, what was the very first thing you put in? Well... I went up to the bathroom first, George said. I used a lot of things in the bathroom and on Mummy's dressing table. Come on then, cried Mr Cranky. Up we go, to the bathroom. 
And when they got there, they found a whole lot of empty tubes and empty aerosols and empty bottles. Oh, that's great, said Mr Cranky. That tells us exactly what we need. If anything's empty, it means you used it. So Mr Cranky started making a list of everything that was in the bathroom. And then they went on to Mrs Cranky's dressing table. A box of powder, said Mr Cranky, writing it down. Helga's hair set, flowers of turnips, perfume. Terrific! This is going to be easy. Where did you go next? Um, to the laundry room, George said. But are you sure you haven't missed out anything up here, Dad? Well, that's up to you, my boy, said Mr Cranky. Have I? Uh, I don't think so, said George. Right. Down in the laundry room, Mr Cranky wrote down the names of all the bottles and the cans. My goodness me! What a mass of stuff you need, he cried. No wonder you did magic things. Oh, is that the lot? No, Dad, it's not, said George. And he led his father down to the shed. And there, on the table, were the five big empty bottles of animal medicines. Right, anything else? asked Mr Cranky. And George scratched his head and thought and thought. But he couldn't remember having put anything else in. So, Mr Killy Cranky leapt into his car and drove down to the village and bought new bottles and tubes and cans of everything on his list. And then he went to the vet and got a fresh supply of all the animal medicines George had used. Soon, all the things that Mr Cranky had bought were lined up on the kitchen table. Now, show me how you did it, George, he said. Come along, show me exactly how you mixed them all together. One by one, George poured and squeezed the things into the saucepan. Keep at it, my boy, cried Mr Cranky, dancing round the kitchen. Keep putting them in. Don't stop. Don't pause. Don't hesitate. It's a pleasure, my dear fellow, to watch you work. With everything so close at hand, the whole job didn't take George more than ten minutes. But when it was all done, the saucepan didn't somehow seem to be quite as full as it had been the first time. Now what did you do? cried Mr Cranky. Did you stir it? I, I boiled it, George said, but not for long, and I stirred it as well. So Mr Cranky lit the gas under the saucepan, and George stirred the mixture with the same long wooden spoon he'd used before. Ah, it's, it's not brown enough, George said. Wait a minute, I know what I've forgotten. What? cried Mr Cranky. Tell me, quick, because if we've forgotten even one tiny thing, then it won't work. At least, not in the same way. A quart of brown gloss paint, George said. That's what I've forgotten. Mr Killy Cranky shot out of the house and into his car like a rocket. He sped down to the village and he bought the paint and he rushed back again. He opened the can in the kitchen and <laughs> he handed it to George. George poured the paint into the saucepan. Aha! That's better, George said. That's much more like the right colour. It's boiling, cried Mr Cranky. It's boiling and bubbling, George. Is it ready yet? It's ready, George said. At least I hope it is. Right, shouted Mr Cranky, hopping about. Let's test it. Let's give some to a chicken. <laughs> Mrs Cranky wasn't very keen to leave her mother sticking up through a roof for the rest of her life. So in the end, two men came with a crane and lifted Grandma out. George's medicine hadn't made her any less grumpy or bad-tempered, but it had made her very tall. And the only place for her to sleep was in the hay barn with the mice and rats. In the meantime, George and his father had used up all the medicine making gigantic animals. They gave it to the pig, the bullocks, the sheep, the pony, and the nanny goat. The marvellous medicine was so fantastic that George and his father went straight back indoors to make some more. The new mixture looked and smelt just as powerful as the first lot, but just to make sure, George took a spoonful out into the farmyard to try it out on one of the chickens. Come on, chicken, he said. Good chicken. Chick, 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 chick. A white chicken with black specks on the feathers walked over to the spoon and went, peck. 
the effect that medicine number two had on this chicken was not quite the same as the effect produced by medicine number one, but it was very interesting. Rawr! shrieked the chicken, and it shot six feet up in the air and came down again. Then sparks came flying out of its beak, bright yellow sparks of fire, as though someone was sharpening a knife on a grindstone inside its tummy. Then its legs began to grow longer. Its body stayed the same size, but the two thin yellow legs got longer and longer and longer. What's happening to it? cried Mr Killy Cranky. Something's wrong, said George. The chicken looked perfectly absurd, with its long, long legs and its ordinary little body perched high up on top. It was like a chicken on stilts. Oh, my sainted aunt, cried Mr Killy Cranky. This chicken's no good to anybody. It's all legs. No one wants chicken's legs. Well, I, I must have left something out, George said. I know you've left something out, cried Mr Cranky. Think, boy, think. What was it you left out? I've got it, said George. Flea powder for dogs. And I used some brown shoe polish too. Mr Cranky was already running to his car and soon he was heading down to the village to buy more flea powder and more shoe polish. When he got back, George poured the flea powder into the giant saucepan, then he scooped the shoe polish out of its tin and added that as well. This was marvellous medicine number three. George boiled it and stirred it just as before, then he took a spoonful of it out into the yard to try on another chicken. Mr Cranky ran after him, flapping his arms and hopping with excitement. Come and watch this one, he called out to Mrs Cranky. Come and watch us turning an ordinary chicken into a lovely great big one that lays eggs as large as footballs. I hope you do better than you did last time, said Mrs Cranky. Come on, chicken, said George. Chick, 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 chick. Have some of the lovely medicine. And a magnificent black cockerel with a scarlet comb came stepping over. The cockerel looked at the spoon and went, peck, then, ah, 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 ah. George and his father and mother watched as the cockerel shot up into the air and came back down again. Watch him now, cried Mr Cranky. Watch him grow. Any moment he's going to start getting bigger and bigger. But the cockerel stood quite still. It looked as though it had a headache. What's happening to its neck? Mrs Cranky asked. It's getting longer, said George. I'll say it's getting longer, said Mrs Cranky. Last time it was the legs, now it's the neck. Who wants a chicken with a long neck? You can't eat a chicken's neck. It was an extraordinary sight. The cockerel's body hadn't grown at all, but the neck was now about six feet long. All right, George, said Mr Cranky. What else have you forgotten? I don't know, said George. Oh, yes, you do, said Mr Cranky. Come along now, boy. Think. There's probably just one vital thing missing, and you've got to remember it. Uh, ah! I put in some engine oil from the shed, said George. Did you have that on your list? Uh, Eureka! cried Mr Cranky. That's the answer! Right, how much did you put in? Uh, half a pint, George said. You're going to have some mighty queer chickens around here if you go on like this, said Mrs Cranky, as they boiled up marvellous medicine number four. You keep out of this, said Mr Cranky. We're doing fine. We've got it this time. You'll see if we haven't. George took a teacup full of the new medicine outside, dipped in the spoon and held it out to a brown hen. Tick, 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 he said. Try some of this. The brown hen walked over and looked at the spoon. Then it went, peck. Ouch, it said. And then a funny whistling noise came out of its beak. Watch it grow, shouted Mr Cranky. Don't be too sure, said Mrs Cranky. Why is it whistling like that? Keep quiet, woman, cried Mr Cranky. Give it a chance. It's getting smaller, said George. Look at it, Dad, it's shrinking. And indeed it was. In less than a minute, the hen was no bigger than a new hatched chick. It looked ridiculous. Oh, give it up, said Mrs Cranky. Pack it in. You'll never get it right. And at that point, Grandma came striding into the yard. From her enormous height, she glared down at the three people below her and she shouted, What's going on around here? Why hasn't anybody brought me my morning cup of tea? It's bad enough having to sleep in the barn with the rats and the mice, but I'll be blowed if I'm going to starve as well. No tea, no eggs and bacon, no buttered toast, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mother, Mrs. Cranky said. We've been terribly busy. I'll get you something right away. Let George get it, the lazy little brute, Grandma shouted. Just then, the old woman spotted the cup in George's hand. She bent down and peered into it, and she saw that it was full of brown liquid. It looked very much like tea. Ho, ho, she cried. Ha, ha, so that's your little game, is it? You look after yourself, all right, don't you? You make sure you've got a nice cup of morning tea, but you didn't think to bring one to your poor old grandma. I always knew you were a selfish pig. Hand it over, George. No, cried Mrs. Cranky. No, Mother, don't. That's not for you. Now you're against me too, shouted Grandma. My own daughter trying to stop me having my breakfast, trying to starve me out. Mr. Cranky looked up at the horrid old woman and he smiled sweetly. Of course it's for you, Grandma, he said. You check it and drink it while it's nice and hot. Don't think I won't, Grandma said, bending down from her great height and reaching out a huge horny hand for the cup. No, no, Grandma, George cried out, pulling the cup away. You mustn't. You're not to have it. Give it to me, boy, yelled Grandma. Don't, cried Mrs. Cranky. That's George's marvellous. Everything's George's round here, shouted Grandma. George this, George that. I'm fed up with it. And she snatched the cup. She snatched it out of little George's hand and carried it high up out of reach. Drink it up, Grandma, Mr. Cranky said, grinning hugely. Lovely tea. No, the other two cried. No, no, no. But it was too late. The ancient beanpole had already put the cup to her lips, and in one gulp she swallowed everything that was in it. Mother, wailed Mrs. Cranky, you've just drunk 50 doses of George's marvellous medicine number four, and look what one tiny spoonful did to that little brown hen. But Grandma didn't even hear her. Great clouds of steam were already pouring out of her mouth and nose and ears, and she was beginning to whistle. This is going to be interesting, Mr. Cranky said, still grinning. Now you've done it, cried Mrs. Cranky, glaring at her husband. You've cooked the old girl's goose. I didn't do anything, Mr. Cranky said. Oh, yes, you did. You told her to drink it. A tremendous hissing sound was coming from above their heads. Steam was still shooting out of Grandma's head and whistling as it came. She'll feel better after she's let off a bit of steam, <laughs> Mr. Cranky said. She's going to blow up, Mrs. Cranky wailed. Her boiler's going to burst. Stand clear, said Mr. Cranky. George was quite alarmed. He stood up and ran back a few paces. The jets of white steam kept squirting out of the skinny old hag's head, and the whistling was so high and shrill it hurt his ears. Call the fire brigade! cried Mrs. Cranky. Call the police! Man the hose pipes! Too late, said Mr. Cranky, looking pleased. Grandma, shrieked Mrs. Cranky. Mother, run to the drinking trough and put your head under the water. But even as she spoke, the whistling suddenly stopped and the steam disappeared. That was when Grandma began to get smaller. She'd started off with her head as high as the roof of the house, but now she was coming down fast. Watch this, George, shouted Mr. Cranky hopping around the yard and flapping his arms. Watch what happens when someone's had 50 spoonfuls instead of one. Very soon, Grandma was back to normal height. Stop, cried Mrs. Cranky. That's just right. But she didn't stop. Smaller and smaller she got. Down and down she went. In another moment, she was no bigger than a bottle of lemonade. How do you feel, Mother? asked Mrs. Cranky anxiously. Grandma's tiny face still bore the same foul and furious expression it always had. Her eyes, no bigger now than little keyholes, were blazing with anger. How do I feel? she yelled. How do you think I feel? How would you feel if you'd been a glorious giant a minute ago and suddenly you're a miserable midget? Uh, she's still going, shouted Mr. Cranky gleefully. She's still getting smaller. And by golly, she was. When she was no bigger than a pencil, Mrs. Cranky made a grab for her. She held her in her hands and she cried, How do I stop her getting smaller still? You can't, said Mr. Cranky. She's had 50 times the right amount. By then, Grandma was the size of a matchstick and still shrinking fast. A moment later, she was no bigger than a pin, then a pumpkin seed, then... Where is she? cried Mrs. Cranky. I've lost her. Hooray, said Mr. Cranky. 
She's gone. She's disappeared completely, cried Mrs. Cranky. Well, that's what happens to you if you're grumpy and bad-tempered, said Mr. Cranky. Great medicine of yours, George. George didn't know what to think. For a few minutes, Mrs. Cranky kept wandering around with a puzzled look on her face, saying, Mother, where are you? Where have you gone? Where have you got to? How can I find you? But she calmed down quite quickly. And by lunchtime, she was saying, Oh, well, I suppose it's all for the best, really. She was a bit of a nuisance around the house, wasn't she? Yes, said Mr. Cranky. She most certainly was. George didn't say a word. He felt quite trembly. He knew something tremendous had taken place that morning. For a few brief moments, he had touched with the very tips of his fingers the edge of a magic world. Goodbye. <laughs>